Last week, we studied Psalm 56 under the title, Fear. And this week, I would like to introduce the title, something similar, Suffering of Believers and Plan of God, based on Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 to 14, and Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. The title is Suffering of Believers and Plan of God. Let me read Jeremiah 29, verses 10 to 14. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plan to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you uh, into exile. This is one of the most quoted Bible passages ever, and uh, particularly verse 11 is the most claimed Bible promises, for I know the plans I have for you. You can uh, look at this Bible verses uh, in homes, in vehicles, and different places, uh, and uh, most people do not understand the background of this particular passage. This promise, which most people claim around the world, was not given when everything was going all right. Jeremiah, the prophet uh, who spoke on behalf of God, wrote this passage as a letter and sent to people uh, that is, Judeans, Jews who were in Babylon serving as slaves. You all know uh, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judea and Jerusalem three times. And he took healthy young men and women, skilled people to Babylon. The rest of the people were left behind. A lot of them got killed in the war. And you can study about it from Book of Lamentation. How the city used to be earlier and how the city turned out to be. Uh, Jeremiah was just looking at the city and he was wailing and weeping as he was praying to God, and confessing to God. So this particular passage that we read was uh, given to people of Israel or people of Judea who were in Babylon serving as slaves. They were away from their place of comfort, their known place. Somehow they left their families. A lot of moms and dads were not together. A lot of parents and children were not together. They were in exile. It is something like today. You know, we have friends and we have families, but we are not able to travel particularly tomorrow or today, we are going to stay within the confines of our home. For about 14 hours, no one will be on the street. And this is happening in places like Italy, places like China, uh, United States, uh, because of this virus. People are kind of self-exiled places. A lot of them have lost their loved ones. Four people in the same family. And uh, breadwinners who lost their lives. And families are really thinking, how are we going to take care of our families? You know, it is interesting in the scripture, God calls Nebuchadnezzar, the man who invaded Jerusalem for three times, my servant. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 9. And uh, he also calls Cyrus the emperor of Persia, my servant. 
You all remember a few weeks ago we studied the book of Joel where God calls locust my army. It's puzzling to us. How come God calls Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, locust, his instruments? Probably God in some way or other working behind the spread of this virus. We cannot give any theological answer, but from this particular passage, we can learn some principles and some truth that can actually comfort us and guide us. Let's look at the state of the recipients of Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14, or the people who received the letter from Jeremiah in which this important promise was given. What was their status? You can actually look at it in Lamentation chapter 1 to 5, entire book. It's an easy reading. You can read it. But I have highlighted about five points here. Displaced in a foreign land. You know, when, you, when people were in foreign land, they were humiliated. Physical, mental, and emotional suffering they were undergoing. Then the second one, unpleasant living conditions and lack of freedom in a foreign land. The third one is despair. In other words, there is no hope and there is no future. And fourth one is apparent absence of God. There was no temple. There was no sacrifice. No priest. No sacred city, Jerusalem. Prior to their exile, they identified their religion with the temple, their sacrifices, their priests, and this holy city called Jerusalem. And you can look at it in the book of Lamentation. Lamentation actually, in some way, compares what it used to be earlier and what it is right now, after the invasion. No young men and women walking around no healthy people in the city, no water, no food, and it was gloomy. Gloomy present. And I uh, look around the city of Bangalore, particularly our own area, Kothanur. There is gloominess everywhere. These five things were a few things that I highlighted were the state of people of Judea when they were in exile. Let's just look at God's take on their state. People probably thought God left them. That is, that is what we see in the book of Lamentation. And that is what we see in the book of Ezekiel. God leaving the people. And they even coined the phrase, Ichabod. But based on this particular passage that we read, let's look at God's take on uh, their state. How God views the state of the people in exile. The events were not accidental or for bad of the people. Probably people were shocked. What's happening here? You know, we have a covenant relationship with God. God uh, has made a covenant with us through Abraham and through David and through Moses. And they thought God would always come and just take care of them when the enemies come to invade. But that did not happen. Not only the invasion, even the temple was destroyed. And all the things in the temple were taken to a pagan land. But God is saying in verse 29... I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans not to harm you. The events that happened to people of Judea were not accidental or for the bad of the people. It was not to harm the people. God was sovereignly in control of their situation. God is saying, I know. I know. What's happening to you? I know when Nebuchadnezzar came to invade in 605, 
I know when he came to invade the second time in 592, and I know when he came in 586, and I know when he took people like Daniel, Ezekiel, Zedekiah, and all these people as captives to uh, Babylon. I know. In other words, God was sovereignly in control of their situation. You know, some of us use the word uh, sovereign quite often. It is a good time for us now to think about the word sovereign. When we use the word sovereign, it means God is supreme over all superpowers. There is no power that is above God. Now, coronavirus is the most powerful one. It is the talk of the world. Is God susceptible to coronavirus? Not at all. He's bigger. You know, he used locust and he called locust his uh, army. When he used Nebuchadnezzar, he said, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. And he used the same title to Cyrus. I'm not really sure if God would use the same title to coronavirus. But when we use the word uh, sovereign, we mean God is sovereign over all superpowers. And he knows everything. He knows the past, he knows the present, and he knows the future. That is why he is saying in verse 11 of Jeremiah 29, I know, you know, if you expand that expression in Hebrew, I know the plans that I'm planning for you. In and through the invasion, in and through the life in exile, in and through all the humiliation, slavery, and all those things, gloominess, God is saying, I know. Because he knows everything. There is nothing that he does not know. God is having power over everything. He has the power over corona. He has power over any nation. He has power over poverty. He has power over economic system. Anything. As we read in Psalm 139, he is there everything and he knows everything and he has power over a thing. He transcends every known created thing but yet caring for them so intimately. He cares for you. He cares for the animals. He cares for the trees and he cares for everything that he created. Being in existence before the creation of the world and will be existing even beyond everything is done away with. Not being bound by time, yet controlling time and space. Not constrained by space, but its authority over entire universe. That is our God. He is sovereign. And we will come back to the passage here. At the appropriate time, God would reverse their predicament. That is what he says. In verse 10, he says, This is what the Lord says, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. You know, when people were thinking God has forgotten, God is not interested, or God has given up on us, but God is saying, I know the plans I have for you. When 70 years are over for Babylon, I will come. And there are a few things we can actually talk about here. Number one, God has a plan, a blueprint. Whenever we uh, look at this plan in the Old Testament, it expresses an intellectual act that occurs in the heart to weave, to join together. God is saying, now you are seeing everything unraveling, okay? Things are not happening the way we expect things to go. But I have a plan. In other words, I am devising my plan through all of them. I have a plan. And God also says in verse 11 that he was going to give them peace. In other words, completeness. Right now they were not complete. Even before they went to Babylon as slaves, they were not complete. But now God is saying, I know the plans I have for you. The plan is not to harm you. 
but to give you a future and a hope and a peace. You all know the meaning of peace is completeness, prosperity, wholeness. God is promising to these people who were suffering and people who were in an unpleasant condition that he was going to give them a peace. And he also says that he was going to give them a future and hope. If you read Lamentation, people thought that was it. The Jewish race has come to an end. They thought the nation that they loved so much is gone from their hands. But God says in verse 10 of Jeremiah 29, after 70 years for Babylon are over, I will bring you back. And it happened. You can actually go back to book of Ezra chapter 1 and we see Zerubbabel and Joshua coming back to Jerusalem. A little bit later you will see Ezra coming back to Jerusalem. A little bit later you will see Nehemiah coming back to Jerusalem. And a few uh, hundred years later, Jesus visited the temple that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. God has a plan for people who are serving in Babylon as slaves. It's beautiful. These days, we are going through a tough time. We don't know what's happening. We don't know how many days will it take for us to change this platform and come back to our normal corporate gathering. I know some people who have lost their jobs. I know some people are going through financial crisis. There are several people who are stranded in different countries. They don't have money. They don't have place to go. It's suffering everywhere. Uncertainty everywhere. Those of us who are in business and uh, we have to close down uh, because no one is coming. No one is buying things. And our clients have dwindled. And, you know, even look at the church. And uh, sometimes we are concerned how we are going to take care of the, uh, the rent and how we are going to take care of monthly pay to the full-time ministers. But God says He has a plan for those who are in exile. And the things that happened are not accidental, but God was sovereignly in control of the situation. Until God changes the uh, apparent difficult days, the people of Judah must do few things. I have highlighted three things here in verse 12, 13, and 14. Let me read these three verses here. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. You know, God says, I have a plan, but the plan is going to come in the near future. But between the present and the future, there are a few things the people in exile needed to do, people in Babylon needed to do. Number one, they needed to pray. It is interesting in the last uh, few weeks, theme of prayer has been coming continuously. When we studied book of Joel, when people were shocked to see the destruction around them because of the unexpected uh, invasion of locust. In Joel chapter 2 verse 12, we saw, you come back to me with fasting and prayer, with weeping, with tears. Last week, we saw from Psalm 56, uh, when, the, when fear grips us, when we don't know where to go and how to really handle our situation, we need to pray. And here, that is what we see in verse 12. You will call on me and come and pray to me. I'll listen to you. You don't need to go to Jerusalem to pray. You don't need to have the priest to help you pray. And you don't need to have all the special days to come and pray. But you can pray. At the 
beginning of the worship service, Pastor Caleb uh, read a Bible passage. There is a time that is going to come, not in uh, Mount Gerizim, not in Jerusalem, but people are going to worship the Lord in truth and spirit, not necessarily in holy places. For us, those who are holed up in our houses, this is a beautiful time, God-given time for us to come and pray. We don't need to do anything special. Just pour our hearts, just as Hannah poured her heart when she was facing ridicule, isolation, and when he, she was going through shame in the society. She prayed. You know, in Psalm 34, we see this poor man cried. The Lord heard him and delivered him from all his troubles. Uh, God's ears are open to our cry. Even if God has intended something, and we see in history, God has relented. You see that, the primary example in the book of Jonah. He was determined to destroy the city of Nineveh. When people fasted and prayed, God relented and He changed. You take the model of Jesus. Jesus spent a lot of time in prayer. Prayer is not something that we utter every day. It is just pouring our hearts, pouring our fear before God and say, God, we don't know what to do. We just come to you, throwing our hands up and say, there is nothing that we can do. Our military, our economic prowess, the savings that we have, the strategies that we know, none of them are working. Therefore, we come to you. The second one is seeking. You know, in verse uh, 12 and 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your hearts. One thing I see in Facebook, where is God in this? Four people in a family died because of this invisible enemy. Where is God? God, there are small kids. They have become orphans because mom's passed away, dad's passed away. Where is God? People are asking. But in this verse, we see, seek God and you will find me. It is like you are in exile and you are going through so much of trouble. You are far away from Jerusalem and you are thinking, oh, we cannot search for God here because God is confined only to the territory of Judea. No, not at all. God says, you can seek me in Babylon. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Jesus says, seek, you shall find. That is what we need to really do when we are holed up in our house. You can actually spend some time watching TV and looking at news. But a lot of time you can uh, searching scriptures, seeking God. God, where are you? God is the closest of closest. Oftentimes, we become oblivious to His presence. The third one is in verse 14. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations, declares the Lord. The third, uh, the, uh, third one is finding God because He can be found. This is very, very interesting. We don't need to go to a distant place to find God. We can find God right there. And He's there to give us comfort and He's there to answer our prayers. You know, as we discussed last week, we leave the answer to God. You know, people who were in Babylon, they wanted a reprieve immediately. They wanted deliverance immediately. But God has His own time and He is working with His uh, clock. But we can pray, we can seek, and we can find Him. God will become available to them in the place of displacement and the state of despair. That is what we read in verse 14. He says, you will find me. I will be found. And in that, an amazing promise is there. God is going to restore 
two times it is mentioned. I'm going to restore. That is the theme that we saw two weeks ago in the book of Joel. Now you are so surprised by the devastation that has happened around. But you come back to me, I'm going to restore everything the lo locusts uh, have destroyed. And that is exactly what God is saying here. I'm going to restore the people I used to bring you to Babylon. I'm going to punish them. No one will find them. They will look for Babylon. Babylon will not be there. But God says, you will continue to be there. And you will come back to the land from which you were displaced. You will be restored. There may be a lot of destruction, devastation, gloomy situations that are happening. And this particular passage is very uh, important to us. God is a God of restoration. The second one, God says, I will gather. The families that were displaced, scattered, I will gather them. It's an amazing promise. You know, through Jesus, God the Father continues to reach out to the hopeless and those who are in despair and makes himself available to them. Just as there was an exile in the Old Testament, for you and me, there are two types of exiles in the New Testament. One, people who are away from God, as we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. You were at that time without the Messiah, alienated from the citizenship of Israel, and strangers of the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That is what we were once upon a time, and there are a lot of people... That is what they are right now. They are far away from God, exiled from God. There is no hope. And there is no Messiah for them. There is no way they can pray, they can seek, and they can find. But some of us, you and me, we have another type of ex exile because of sin that we have left in our lives. The sin separates us. And we have gone on a detour. As we read in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess with your sins, God is just and righteous to forgive us as all our unrighteousness. As we think about Jeremiah, the way the people in exile were promised to come back. And for Christians we can actually think about these two exiles. There are some people who are exiled and God has chosen some of them. They need to come back to the fold. You and me, sometime, we may come to church and we may do all sorts of religious work, but we are still exiled. As we saw last week and the previous week, there is no excitement, there is no passion, there is no uh, desire to uh, pray or study or be with the people of God. There are idols in our lives. There are sins in our lives. We can get back to God. God uses trials to bring out the best in us. Whereas the devil hopes that they will bring, uh, bring out the worst in us. That is the trials will bring out the worst in us. No one is exempt from trials. Christians go through trials. Non-Christians go through trials. But God uses trials to bring out the best in our lives. As we read the book of Jeremiah, the reason why God took these people away was to give a cooling period for Judea for 70 years. 70 years, no cultivation, no life, so that, you know, it is a kind of cooling years, Sabbath years, and God would bring them back. Maybe the trials for us that we are going through, you know, I, let me complete my thought there, is when they were in Babylon, they were being purged from their sin. And they were uh, cleansed when they were in Babylon. Maybe the trial that we are going through, we, some of us can actually become oblivious to the trials that we are going through. It doesn't bother us at all because 
you know, we think, okay, it is only in Italy, it is only in Spain, or it is only in China, but, you know, somehow we can survive. But if we can really look at the history and look at the way God works, He works through situations like this. Probably He is trying to bring the best out of us. We must also remember that a good number of trials are not only divinely ordered, they are also divinely controlled, just as the locust. When locust was invading Judea and Jerusalem, it was there everywhere, but God was in control. And God wanted to bring His people back to Himself. In other words, it was divinely ordered and it was divinely controlled. Warren Wiersbe, an expositor, says like this, When God permits His children to go through furnace, He keeps His eye on the clock and His hand on the thermostat. How true it is. When He permits His people to go through the furnace, He knows how long they need to go. He has His clock. And He also keeps His hand on the thermostat that it will not be too much. Trials prove the genuineness of our faith. And trials remove the impurities from our lives and result in praise, glory, and honor at the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I am, you know, I, I have 101 reasons to feel gloomy about the situation. When I look around today, I look outside of my apartment. No children were playing. No one was walking around. A uh, lot of pigeons normally would not uh, perch on the ground, but they were on the ground, just enjoying their time. And uh, I looked at the streets last night. No one was walking, and very few vehicles. Maybe after 8, 8.13, there was no vehicle. Hardly any vehicle. We look at life so gloomy. There are 101 reasons to be discouraged about. On the other hand, we see God is sovereignly in control of it. He says to people in Babylon, I have a plan for you. A detailed plan for you. A plan to give you hope and future. And I will give you peace that is completeness, prosperity, and wellness to the people. But this is what God says. When you are in Babylon, don't just go and sit quietly. Take this time to pray. Prayer is an amazing platform for us to get close to God. The more we pray, doesn't mean God is going to answer all the prayers but, uh, you know, the, the dead skins, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the sins that have let in our lives, they all slowly start going away. And uh, suddenly we will see our heart burning with passion and excitement. So between God's deliverance and our pleasant, gloomy situation, let's take time to pray. And I'm pretty sure uh, some of you will be aware of what's going to happen from tomorrow. We will have a prayer drive. Uh, for a week, we will spend time, if possible, with fasting. If not, just regular prayer. And uh, the rota will be uh, made. Uh, Jackson and Pastor Tia will come around you or send a notice to you that you can actually put your name. You can spend an hour in prayer. Make sure you take time to confess or repent and get back to God. Then seek God. It's a time for us to really search through the Scripture. God, what is it that I have done that has taken me away from God? God, what is it that I have displeased you? What is it that I have let you down? I have made you so small. Seek God. And God says, you will find me. So the takeaway for us today is, with prayer and worship, prepare yourself for God's plan to happen out of your situation. 
with prayer and worship. Prepare yourself for God's plan to happen. That is sure. Whatever God has promised, it is going to come through. God's promises are always yes and amen. But in the meantime, let's spend time in prayer and worship and wait expectantly for God to act. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the Bible passage that we were able to study. Oftentimes, we claim the promise, but Father, we hardly understand the background in which the promise came. It was when the people were going through such a difficult time. We are right now going through a difficult time. A lot of our plans, uh, Father, have been uh, changed or canceled. A lot of things that we wanted to do are unable to do. The world is unraveling. We don't know what holds us, uh, holds for us tomorrow. But Father, we believe that you are sovereignly in control of the situation. Therefore, we come to you. You help us, you equip us to spend these days when we work from home, when we uh, stay at home, to pray, to seek, and to find you. May you continue to speak to us from this, word, uh, from this passage. In Jesus' name, amen.